everybody. James Yeager with Tactical Response. I'm here with my good friend, Super Dave Harrington today. Uh, Super Dave is here in town, and uh, we've been sharing information all morning, and uh, he's going to actually shoot our fighting rifle class this weekend. And um, But I wanted to introduce you to all of my all of my people. Who is Super Dave Harrington? Like, Tell me how you got started shooting and all that stuff. Well, I, I think I was about... Um my uh, early 20s and I got a job at Night Owl Security and immediately upon uh, completion of the interview I was given a Smith & Wesson Model 10 38 Special Model 10 and that was it and I was like well uh, aren't you going to give me some ammo (laughs) and he's like "Ah, that's on you but um (laughs) I literally taught myself to shoot, uh, I mean, beyond, um, you know, what my father did for me as a young child, and uh, the earliest I can remember ever ever having pressed the trigger uh, was with my father. I was five years old, and we lived in Kansas, Mm -hmm. and we used to go out and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with my brothers and shoot. Pretty cool. But I got serious about it um, when I got that job. Mm-hmm. And I used to uh, go down to like Jim Bob's uh, gun shop and buy, you know, a 50 uh, round bag of reloads. And I'd go down on the Wolf River in Mississippi and hunt water moccasins. Right. And so I had, uh, you know, the onus was on me to not get bit. <laughs> So, <laughs> and and the, the worse of a shot you are, the closer you got to get to the snake. <laughs> exactly, if you can see them in, to begin with. But um, that was when I really got serious about shooting. Was that uh, original uh, employment that required me to carry a firearm, and um, I just took off from there. The I've had uh, kind of an eclectic military background. Uh, I started off in the Navy Seabees. Of course, my father was career Navy. Uh, I was a heavy equipment mechanic. That's where I got my mechanic, mechanical uh, background, critical thinking skills, initial critical thinking skills. Um, I punched out of the Navy a little shy of five years and went into the Air Force Reserves as a security specialist. And I had it. I had it figured out. I had two directions I wanted to go. Uh, At the time, and this was roughly uh, 1983, 84 time frame, you could enlist into the Army and go straight, you know, enlist for the Army Special Forces, Mm -hmm. uh, which I had, you know, great interest in doing. But then again, on the other side of the coin, I had law enforcement interest as well. Right. I decided to go into the Air Force um, security specialist mode. Uh, because I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew, um, being active duty, so I was an active reservist. Mm-hmm. Well, I wound up uh, going through the Security Police Academy in Lackland, went to, uh, and I was stationed in Biloxi, Mississippi, at Keesler Air Force Base, and but we did our work at Herbert uh, Spec Ops Airfield, uh, which was part of Eglin at the time, and. I was exposed to uh, the SF guys one more time, wound up inadvertently uh, having to lock some dudes up because they were trying to <laughs> they were trying to make it back to their hooch, but they were a little inebriated and they broke the red line uh, trying to get back to where they I, were I don't supposed know what that to be. Means. Breaking the uh, around um, the airfield is a red line, literal, literally painted red line, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a security issue and gotcha you're not cleared to be inside the red line right that's it um well these guys after that whole ordeal was over uh these guys invited me to their hooch and we just sat around talking i was like oh yeah man i almost enlisted you know and blah 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 and the that program they called it the sf baby program that program was closed at the time so what I did is I, I negotiated an inter-service transfer from the Air Force to the Army and just went straight infantry, airborne, and just started knocking things out one at a time, infantry, airborne, ranger. 
And the morning I had graduated from the primary leadership development course, I saw a very, well, it wasn't even a paragraph, it was maybe a couple of three sentences uh, in the base newspaper about applying for special forces. And here were the prereqs. Well, that morning of graduation, I had just completed the only prereq I needed. So oh, shit. <laughs> I put in and mm-hmm. pretty much um, spent, it went really fast, spent 19, a little over 19 years in uh, the Army Special Forces, total of 23 years uh, in the service. How I got into the training loop, I was still active duty. Um, I was on short final. Um, and Ken Hackathorn uh, was responsible for my decision to pursue training as an option uh, because at the time in like 04 I was uh, on board with Triple Canopy and had gone to Iraq to do contracting stuff but my neck failed and two weeks to the day I, of returning to the States, I was on the table for nine and a half hours having my neck replaced. Well, the downside to that... Um, there, there sounds like there's a lot of downsides to having your neck replaced. Well, I've been having um, physical uh, issues over, you know, the years. Um, wear, tear, injuries, you know, surgery, recoveries. But uh, coming back to Ken... Um, he said some very uh, telling things, uh, or told me some very telling things that uh, pushed me over the edge to uh, start training as a on a professional level as a commercially, of, yeah. yeah, commercially, you know, as a means to pay my bills. Um, a lot of my running buddies in the service uh, allow me to digress. I went through. Uh, called O&I, Operations and Intelligence Program, and Larry Vickers was, uh, that's when I met, originally met Larry, Larry was in uh, our small team, we, you know, we were broken down into four-man teams mm-hmm. for the Operations and Intelligence uh, course, and one thing led to another, Larry uh, built me my first 1911 blaster, nice. I got seriously um, interested in competitive shooting started shooting competitively in about 94 95 time frame um and the rest um it just kind of fell into place i was in the perfect mechanism at work uh, at the special warfare center to pursue additional training or professional development uh, in support of my job my position i was the um non-commissioned officer in charge of the weapons training for the Sephardic program. If if you don't mind, define the Sephardic program. Okay, the Sephardic program is a, uh, it's a close hold program, and the acronym stands for the Special Forces Advanced Reconnaissance Target Analysis and Exploitations Techniques Course. Uh, pretty much a long blurb for door kicking. I've managed to, uh, through that mechanism, early, I did actually did two tours there. I did a tour in that duty position in 92 to 96, broke contact, went and did some other pursuits, uh, was asked to come back. I had put my paperwork in to retire in 2000, and I was asked if there was anything we could do to retain you in the community, what would that be? And this is the uh, group sergeant major. Uh, and I said, well, give me my old job at range 37 back. Well, you were there four years. That's a long hitch for somebody to be in that position, right? Yes. When you were there previously. Yes. Um, well, that's kind of a standard tour for the special warfare center. Mm-hmm. It's a four year hitch there. Um, at the time uh, of retirement, uh, a friend of mine was the NCOIC of the committee out there, and lo and behold, a few phone calls were made and I was plugged back in. 
so I wound up doing an additional three years, something like that. I'm like November from November of 2000 to June of 03. Um, I was asked to come back, get them back on track. You know how things kind of ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just worked out. But in this interim period of being plugged into the, that specific assignment, a decade apart, I had all the opportunity in the world to pursue my own professional development by going to, uh, I think I went to the FBI firearms instructors course three times maybe. I uh, went to the Secret Service instructors course, uh, burned it down. Um, I had, here's when I was at the Secret Service program, this is uh, kind of a, a sidebar. I had made a comment about the Clintons, which was not well received. And lo and behold, they had um, tried to get um, Mrs. Clinton to present me the plaque from the course. (laughs) I didn't know this. But the morning at graduation... The uh, it was hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait to the extent that we knew something was up, something was going on because there's no way the Secret Service is going to be disorganized on any level in any manner. Right. And it was a weather, it was a weather call, man. They had to make a weather call. It was so heavily fogged in. Uh, the AIC of the detail called the movement, so it didn't happen. And then they, of course, they told me that afterwards, but (laughs) I'm glad it turned out the way it did. Um, Competitive pursuits, uh, shooting competitive, I started like 94, 95 time frame. Um, I pursued both uh, USPSA and IDPA. Uh, you wouldn't pursue IDPA for another year or two. That didn't that didn't get invented until '96, right? Because right. when, when I talk about when I started shooting like IPSC, they go, "Why didn't you shoot IDPA?" I go, "It wouldn't have been invented for several more years." Right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, you know what? Now that I think of it, man, um, you're spot on with that because I believe it was wasn't until like maybe '97 or '98 that IDPA got stood up. I'll have to check my facts on that one, but um, competition is competition. I don't favor any one type of competition. Uh, I like all competition, any competition that requires you to press the trigger. There's a specific construct for that competition that puts uh, very specific aspects on different types of shooting. So I've always pursued all types of shooting to be as well-rounded as possible. Well, before I met you, I heard about you and always in a positive light. And sometimes with such um, mystique and reverence, I thought you actually might have a superpower. Like I uh, went to Roger shooting school and uh, they're like, Hey, do you know super Dave? I'm like, I haven't met him. I know who you're talking about. And they're like, yeah, he came down here and cleaned this thing all week long every time he shot it. Right. And they said, I said, oh. And they're like, you don't understand. Nobody's ever done that before. Ever. Even the dude that started this place didn't do that. Yeah. I I just want to clarify on one point. Um, I shot an advanced. The first time I shot. Uh, of course, the goal at Rogers is to shoot an advanced score out of a total of 125 possible targets. Uh, I shot a 110, which is the minimum for advanced. And But I did not understand how the Rogers mechanism worked. Or the, Listen, the reality has got nothing to do with the... With the with the uh, the rumor of who Super Dave is, right? Don't don't mess that up. Okay. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, the legend I of was Super aggravated. Dave. I had no concept of having achieved off the bat what it takes people generally a week to achieve, and I shot an advanced score every time I shot the test for that. Yeah, my first go round there, um, amazing cannot say enough about Bill Rogers. He's got an awesome mechanism plugged in and uh, 
in a lot of respects, the target array itself and how it's timed out, the presentations, multiple targets, all of it. It's it's um, it's fascinating. It's almost the instructor itself takes you to task. Yeah, and so I've so you 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 carry a. Uh, a good reputation among a lot. You've already named Larry Vickers and Ken Ackerthorn, but I've, I've, I've I heard your name many, many, many times before I ever met you. And uh, so you have a you have a very good uh, a very good reputation in the industry industry among guys that, that teach. And so when I finally got to meet you, I I kind of I kind of got it. The reason I wanted to do this podcast and and I want to do some videos with you is is um, like guys like you and Hack. Um, or what I like to and, and me started out teaching in the analog days where you had to be put in a gun magazine to get anywhere and right. stuff like that. Well, Vickers and me and a couple of us have managed to go from analog to digital, and that's what we're doing now is digital stuff. And so, uh, so what I want, what I told Hack, and what I'll tell you is we gotta we gotta make people know who you are, and and you've gotta we've gotta get you out there and let them. You know, we got to get you on YouTube and all this stuff. You guys need to know who this guy is because what he does is with with guns is is near legendary, uh, uh, capable of, of of any any time he shoots a gun. It, it's fantastic. I've told more than one person, and I mean this, he is absolutely the best pistol shooter I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of pistol shooters, and so. And so that's what I'm trying to do is let these folks know who you are and uh, and let them know what you have to offer. And uh, so as we continue this conversation, I just want you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, um, on this point alone, I am my own worst enemy as it comes to self-promotion. Uh, I didn't come up in that realm. Um, <laughs> let me interrupt. Let me interrupt yeah. you. A lot of these guys come from the quiet professional, like they come from these these spec ops backgrounds where you don't stand out. You don't try to, as if push your team aside and be the guy that's out in the spotlight. And so, a lot of these guys, there are a lot of guys that have a wealth of knowledge. It could teach you wonderful things. You, you'll just never know who they are because because modesty is part of the job. And they think that anytime they promote themselves that they're somehow doing their their fraternal order some type of disservice. Maybe they are, I don't know. But I, here's what I do know. Uh, the Army is not paying your bills right now. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I, I get it, but uh, I'm, I'm telling you, we gotta get you, they gotta, these, these folks gotta know who you are. They, they, right, I'm working on my, my media skills. <laughs> Uh, my technical skills. Now I can wear you out with a number two pencil <laughs> and a piece of paper, but I'm trying to bring myself up to speed on that. Well, I got I got a few questions uh, from some folks in the alumni forum. Okay, uh, where did the nickname Super Dave come from? You can pass if you want to pass. <laughs> um, it came from pretty much uh, it. It's dual task. Kind of fifty uh, percent of it is from performance-oriented endeavors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like um, I was gifted at birth with, um, you know, my level of physical coordination and reflexes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm ambidextrous. I take full advantage of that. Um, so I cannot discount the performance-oriented issues, but. The flip side of the coin is I kind of have a knack for getting myself out of the trouble I get myself into. <laughs> All so, right. You know, All right. Fair enough. The, uh, I don't know how it happens, man. It, <laughs> trouble just finds me. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, do you have a superpower? So I guess shooting is it, right? Shooting is it. If I had to have one, that's it. All right. Um, so you've had some some parts replaced. You said your neck earlier, right? Uh, and so w one of my students is asking, uh, how are your knees and stuff doing? Like physically, right now I'm doing really well. Uh, of course, uh, I've had my knees replaced. I had bilateral knee replacement about two and a half. Well, this June will be three years. Let me let me yeah. kind of rewind it. Go back to where he said Airborne Ranger a little while ago. Um, 
like these guys that that live this life that jump out of planes and and do all this stuff they they literally give up their body for their country and they and they are in pain and they have to get parts replaced the rest of their life they they use up all their good miles when they're in the military and then they just left with broken parts after so when you see some guy you know with a knee or a hip thing you know with his army hat on that dude that dude paid for that you know and and right. uh so i just i just uh, want i want you to know that i'm not we're not making i'm not making fun of him for being old like he fucking he gave that shit up for us so so go ahead uh real quick rundown i've had two um operations on my left ankle i've had my knees replaced i've had three spine surgeries to include my neck being replaced and i just this is my first opportunity out of the gate from having my left hip replaced to find out where I'm at physically. However, the success of my left hip replacement has really skylined the deficiencies of my right, right. hip. So I'm feeling that already. <laughs> the right one used to be your better one. Right. The right <laughs> one used to be the better one. Now it's not. I gotcha. But I'm looking at January, February next year to get the right one taken care of. Just uh, pure curiosity. What is a neck replacement? What does that mean? Uh, what they did, um, all of my um, discs in my neck were basically herniated mm-hmm. and pinched off my spine. I was losing right. My, the right side of my body. And um, what they did is they went in, uh, removed all the C-spine discs and replaced them with cadaver bone spacers, mm-hmm. which um, I'll tell you offline what Ken had to say about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> well, this is this is uh, R-rated, so you can say whatever have, you want. <laughs> um, I have a kind of a stainless steel cage in the front. I have two rods in the back and 20 screws to um, keep my head the only joint that I have in my neck is the like the ball joint where your skull attaches mm-hmm. to your neck right. but um, that put me out of action for about two years yeah I can imagine uh, physically was I would say physically a year and I would say psychologically a, another year for a total of two it put me they um, asked me upon you know when I cycled through all that what could they do better as far as what transpired mm-hmm. um, and the only response I had was put a psychologist on staff mm-hmm. because yep. the hardest thing for me was running around the world at 100 miles an hour with my hair on fire coming to a dead stop right and basically not even be able to physically take care of myself for a period of time. Right. And, uh, but the, um, extracting the positive out of the negative, I documented a lot of work, you know, that I had in my head. That's all I, all I could do is run a keyboard. But, um, I've been beat up and, uh, hurt. You just drive on. Right. You You learn how to maintain the discipline to do the job. Right. So we talked about you training down at uh, Roger Shooting School. Uh, any other classes of note that you've taken over the years that you enjoyed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to train with Ken uh, many times and ghost Ken, work with Ken. Um, we've. It's kind of weird because I've always uh, pursued self improvement, but in different ways mm-hmm. um, anything that focuses you know I, I play the guitar I, but I'm self taught I'm not a musician I play the you're guitar a musician. It's, it's kind of different you're a musician but, I'm, I'm uh, not saying you're any good but right right okay cool <laughs> um, but the timing uh, immediate I mean like playing a musical instrument he actually if, is very good if you make an error it's painfully immediate mm-hmm Timing is critical. Um, Of course, uh, I've been heavily involved in martial arts, boxing, 
um, and, you know, hand to hand combatives, stuff like that. I think what the person was asking is, like, uh, like uh, other, other people they might recognize your name, like Rogers or Hack. Anybody else that you could? Well, see, that's the that's the uh, the weird part about it is like Larry. Somebody made an off comment once upon a time. Uh, well, if Larry Vickers was my friend, I'd be able to shoot as well as you too. And I was like, dude. Where's your head at, man? Me being <laughs> friends with Larry's got nothing to. Me and Larry never really spoke about shooting, which sounds odd. No, <laughs> but I was smart enough to keep my mouth shut, and any chance I had to shoot with Larry, which was often, I paid attention. Yeah, sure. And observed. Um, but me and Larry uh, were, uh, man. It was like me, Larry, Kyle Lamb. Um, Rob Hot, you know mm-hmm. Rob. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I know who he is. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ken Hackthorne was, was like part of a crew, and um, other than uh, my working relationship with Bill Rogers, as far as Rogers Shooting School goes, um, I've not really, in a sense had time to pursue you know self-improvement by training with other people in the industry right uh it's never training is more popular now i believe than it absolutely ever has oh, been yeah, no doubt um it's finally getting the recognition it deserves mm-hmm. uh, instead of just being a gun owner right um I t- you know, know, I was trying to pin a, you down to something there, you know. Yeah. So, you know, but the, the, you, you, um, you listed plenty of people. <laughs> there's, like, uh, through, uh, for example, through Larry uh, and Ken, uh, I know Rob Latham. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a daisy chain effect. Yeah. Um, he, I don't know him, but I've been around him a couple times. He's really funny. Oh, he's an absolute blast. Yeah. He, he can tell you a joke. He can be at a Nationals, tell you a joke, and turn around and wait for the beep and shoot a course fire. It's amazing. He's um, a natural comedian. Yeah, he's Absolutely. Very, very, very funny. Um, so another question is, um, do you still have the your first firearm? What was it? Um, no, I don't have it. Um I sold it and wish I hadn't. Yeah, it, right. it was a Stevens double barrel twenty gauge shotgun. Nice. And uh, I don't know how many you know I've killed many deer with it, countless squirrels, rabbits, right. blah blah blah. Nice. And um, you know, like a bunch of any other young buck, I needed some money, and that's what yeah, that oh, was oh, it. Oh, and yeah, I sold yeah. it and. Knew I'd regret it when I did it, but I didn't understand the depth mm-hmm. of regret that I would have for selling that first blaster. Right. Um, right. So, those of you listening, if you still have and own your first blaster, <laughs> hang on to it. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you do any prepping? Are you a prepper at all? You know, like preparing for yes, the zombies. I, I believe in prepping, but uh, I, only pull, uh, I only believe in prepping to an extent. Um. I don't live in an area, you know, prepping is to me geographical uh, based on where you live and you got to take all these things into consideration. Where I'm at in South Tampa, I'm right in the middle of all of it down there. Mm-hmm. Um, even getting out of Florida right. would be a job in and of itself right? because there's only the two main arteries. My prepping, the extent of my prepping is phased from my transportation and what I can afford to carry in it Mm -hmm. in my vehicle right for a full tank of fuel Mm -hmm. and then I break it down simply in what I can carry right and that's going to consist of uh, food water and ammunition right okay with food water and ammunition I can acquire what else I may need. <laughs> we'll stop there. 
Okay, cool. Um, so I know you know Pat McNamara. The question on here is, was, was Pat a good student of yours? I don't know if you ever trained Pat. No, I never trained. Uh, Pat's never been in a program, training program or anything. Um, I met Pat years ago. Um, I want to say it was 90. Pat was in first group in uh, Washington State. Um, I was in first group, but I was in the forward deployed battalion in Okinawa, Japan for four years. So I never crossed paths with Pat when he when we were in group mm-hmm. until after... Um, man, I can't really say when, but... Um, Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Pat's a solid dude. Absolutely. Yeah. I like him. I like him a lot. Um, so um, what was the last uh, skill or tactic that you changed your mind about? Like, for instance, like you were always like m- maybe Weaver, 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 and then you went, oh, you know, Isosceles. Like, what's like the last big thing you went, eh, maybe I'll do well, this other way? I, I've never experienced that. And I'll tell you why. I learned early on, I realized very early on, uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have ESP. I'm not telekinetic. I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know what the solution to that problem is going to be. So very early on in my own development, I made up my mind that if it's a viable tactic, I don't care if it's... You know, situation dependent. If it's a viable tactic, whether it's right hand, left hand, uh, pistol, rifle, shotgun, I need to know how to execute that. Period. That, in that manner, that is the only way I can become a well-rounded fighter. Okay. And not, I don't buy into the the dogma so to speak if it's a viable tactic i need to know it and know how to do it well is there one of those tactics that after you learned it it was better than you thought it was or a technique or something after you learn more about it you thought oh this is not as shitty as i thought it was going to be it's okay if it's not 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 really okay. uh, there's been some things i've looked at and uh realized how they could be done more efficiently right but um, there's nothing I've ever really changed my mind about. What's your favorite part about teaching? Seeing the light bulb come on. Seeing people actually improve, even though it is, um, you know, we're basically limited by time and resources in respect to what we have to accomplish and what the focus of the mission is. But I like to think I have a positive influence on people on And it happens on a lot of different levels based on uh, the interaction. But the shooting piece is a shooting piece. And to see someone that is genuinely pleased with their the improvement Mm -hmm. in their ability to perform, that is my job satisfaction. Right. Well, what's funny is, and you know this, people are so hard on themselves. You can see a student have a real improvement and go, man, that is a real improvement. They go, oh, it could be better when it was like a real improvement. Right. right. Exactly. People, people beat themselves up way too much. Absolutely. Too, I way, do that myself. Uh, yeah. Um, so what is the the, the uh, worst firearms myth that you wish would go away? Like one of those, like, all you got to do is rack a shotgun and they'll leave or you know, if you can't get them with six, you can't get them with 60 or, you know, right. Is there one of them that just drives you nuts every time you hear it? (laughs) Oh man, nothing immediately comes to mind, (laughs) but, um, the only, the, the thing that does come to mind is the, it's kind of a train wreck between concealed carry and being prepared to defend yourself and fighting with guns. Mm -hmm. The fighting with guns to me is about fire and maneuver. Right. Well, the train wreck between firing maneuver, firing and maneuvering in a self-defense 
kind of scenario is people don't carry enough reserve ammunition. <laughs> well, I think it's more about they have to be more careful where they put it. <laughs> well, no, I understand that. But, uh, I mean, accountability is accountability, but um, what is the scenario? You know what I mean? I had a guy ask me, what's your uh, normal, you know, what's your EDC, your everyday carry? I'm like, dude, I'm wearing it. And he's like... <laughs> No way, man. And I'm like, yes way. He's why do you have so many mags? And I just had to step it out for him. The the first reserve mag is the replacement mag for the mag in the gun if it fails to perform you know, work properly. Right. The second mag is in case I drop the first mag. All right. I still have a magazine. And then the third and fourth mags are just to ensure that I have enough ammunition to fire and maneuver my way out of pretty much anything I'm going to run into, you know, what I project. Okay, so you carry a loaded gun and four spare mags. Five. Five spare mags. I carry one uh, spare mag on my right side in front of the holster. Right. And that is to ensure that regardless of my body position, I have access to ammo on both sides of my body. Okay. That's uh, that's that's enough mags, I think. Right, I it'll think work. <laughs> I think you're good there. Um, uh, what um, instructor, and this could be book, magazine, or in person, had the the greatest influence on you, either either as a student or a teacher, like who, like mentor or uh, Bob Munden. Bob Munden. Bob tell, Munden. Tell everybody who Bob Munden was. Bob Munden was a trick shooter. Used, um, you know, single action uh, cowboy guns. And I want to say I was about, I don't know, 22, 23, and I became aware of Bob Munden. The fastest man alive. Yep. And I was like, wow, I want to be able to, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. You and, guys that uh, are listening or watching this, go look up some Bob Munden videos absolutely you'll you'll see this guy amazing when he um he shot an egg at 100 yards one shot an egg (laughs) you know (laughs) with a pistol with a pistol (laughs) a single action pistol i was like whoa you know the guy was just on yeah and uh you know we're diminished by his passing but uh his legacy is there to be seen he would do stuff like have have a paper cup on his hand and draw pow, and shoot that paper cup before it would fall and like yeah he was just outstanding like, yeah he was the first guy that I ever saw and it was only on video doing trick shooting and uh, what what an amazing specimen yeah that was <laughs> unbelievable pretty good Bob Munden that, I, I don't know what I expected you to say but it wasn't that right right <laughs> very cool so uh, Canada as you may know they just banned AR-15s um, and over 15,000 kinds of magazine fed semi-auto military style rifles wow that's sad what do you think about that or uh, do you have any opinions that you want to share about gun control in general or anything like that uh, I, I hate it for the Canadians. Um, I don't know what their government's thinking, but um, I know exactly what they're thinking. Yeah, we control. want more control. Exactly. The um, you know, I'll never support any level of gun control. Um, as far as I'm concerned, our rights are clearly specked out in the Constitution and its supporting documents. Uh, everything else is just a form of control. Um, it's sad that you know things are have gotten to the extent that they have uh, politically Uh, I'll vote for Trump as many times as it takes Um, (laughs) well if you vote for him more than one more time then we got got a different problem yeah no doubt (laughs) the um, he's um, I think he's doing an outstanding job I don't know what the uh, the left's focus is <laughs> on him, other than the simple fact that they can't control him, 
He's not a politician. And he came in to clean house. And they don't want to get caught. They're yeah. doing everything possible that they can do to not get busted out yeah. by the man. <laughs> so, but I, I'd like to think it's coming. Yeah, I, I would hope so. While the whole country's been suffering from uh, COVID nineteen, they've been uh, they've been uh, hammering the books and uh, finding some stuff out. Right, exactly. For sure. what, what, what topics do you want to talk about? Do you have something that you, that you, I don't know, dude? How much time do we have? Well, as, as much as we want. That's oh, what's okay, great cool. about this. We can just talk for okay, days, very cool. or, days or hours or whatever. While you're thinking about that, you guys can. Um, find out more about dave uh i'll certainly google but do you have a website they can go to or anything? i did turn on a, a basic website it's uh combat speed.com combat speed.com just one word no caps no nothing plug it in <laughs> tells it gives you some basic information uh, about me and uh what i do uh there's still some technical issues i've got to get on top of in respect <laughs> to manipulating the site right um but uh, you can also find me at Dave Harrington on Facebook. Yep, Dave Harrington is um, pretty easy to find. Yep. Um, so uh, the guys that are watching, do you guys have any questions for them? Anything you might want to know? Okay. Well, we'll end with we'll end with a gear thing. So you're gonna um, you're gonna stick around, and tomorrow, the next couple of days, you're gonna take our fighting rifle class. Right. What are you shooting? Because they're going to want to know about that. Okay, I'm running. Uh, this is actually um, the first opportunity I've had to employ a Wilson Combat Pistol Caliber Carbine. I believe it's the nine. I don't know nine CP model, whatever. It's uh, it's basically laid out just like a AR mm -hmm. as similar to an AR as you can get it's not a competitive uh, when when you say PCC people generally jump to the USPSA you know competitive guns mm -hmm. it's, it's not a competitive blaster even though it, it could be run competitively um, it runs like a Swiss watch it is very it's um, very well made and it has yet to fail me on any level, um, you know, putting it into action, getting it up, zeroed up, hard zeroed, and I've been working with it quite a bit. Um, but I'm interested to see, what's the um, projected round count? 1,500. Oh, it'll, it'll handle that, no problem. Um, look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So where do you think the um, PCC falls in the... Uh the defensive realm, the home defense shotgun, the AR-15, the pistol. Like, where do you what do you place it in practical use? In it? practical use, um, you know, it'd be fine as a home defense weapon. Of course, any shoulder fired uh, weapon is going to increase your hit probability over a pistol. Over yeah. a pistol, yeah, for sure. Um, but it's, I think, it's a niche would be in the urban environment where over penetration would be a concern mm -hmm. uh, sheer uh, max range you know when you think about max range um, and you know the elevation of the barrel and how far the projector will actually go mm -hmm. I'm not talking about don't don't be confused with max effective range right but I'm talking about max range of the caliber you're firing uh, I'm a, in the urban environment. Um, it's the perfect truck blaster. Gotcha. Where you got that thing zeroed? I've, I've always wondered where, where the ideal okay, my, zero. My, my irons are um, zero point aim point impact at fifty, mm -hmm. and I'm running a aim point uh, T two on it, and much like yourself i was like you know what i had to work it out i had to do the math on it uh so i spent the majority of, of a day working different uh, zeros different points of aim point of impact but then taking that and using it uh in action on targets uh 50 yards and in uh 
Mm-hmm. And what I settled on was the perfect zero for me was point A, point impact at 130 yards. 130. At 130, normally. Because I was thinking 100, so I mean, that, that's, that's a right. little, yeah. Well, here's, here's just how the math worked out. Normally, if you come in, let's say you have a hundred yards there, or mm-hmm. you know, majority of people would run. Um, for example, for like an M4, you've got a twenty-five meter zero target, which, provided you zero on that target properly, gives you the ability to get good center hits out to you know what three hundred fifty meters, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, I wanted to go the reverse. I was trying to eliminate having to hold over because one of the most um, here's a myth allow me to digress coming back to the to the the myth part Um, firearms myths there's a it's a train wreck between marksmanship and what you would do under perfect marksmanship circumstances for example if i were a bullseye shooter um do you understand line of white line of white yeah line of white okay back in the day you know the targets are black the centers are black yeah what color are your sights black Black. so you're trying to line up black sights on a black target and it really precludes you from being able to clearly see what the working relationship of the front sight is in the rear notch. So what the bullseye shooters would do is uh, adjust their sights where they could use a six o'clock hold where their sights would be in the white. Gotcha. But hit center X. So black, black center, white right. below that. So they had to adjust their sight. So the top of their sight had just a little bitty white gap there. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. They call that a line of white. Well, the problem with that is, specifically at 50 yards, you're talking, you know, you're receiving a point of impact right at about three, three and a half inches above line of sight. Okay. The reverse is true, like on a carbine or, you know, a rifle caliber carbine or pistol caliber carbine. If you zero at close range, then you don't have to worry about your, you know, holding over. But the problem with that is um, what I know to be a fact in my mind Mm -hmm. at speed in relationship to uh, combat shooting you're going to it takes an extreme amount of training and conditioning to consciously adjust your hold for your zero mm-hmm. okay right. what's norm what normally happens is once you're zeroed for whatever type of shooting or specific type of shooting um, as it relates to combat shooting you're gonna put the sights where you intend to hit but does your zero support your environment and the ranges that you're going to be working at you see what i mean mm-hmm. otherwise there's going to be a holdover or yeah. hold under but where this comes into the play of the problem in respect to combat shooting is those moments in time where you have to deliver a precision shot mm-hmm. okay um whatever that construct is but you, when you absolutely have to make the hit, uh, you need to factor, you know, your zero and trajectory. That's why I never really um, have broken it down to this extent. But that's why I tell people to know where your guns hit. But there's this is the myth part that people can look at ballistic data that's been generated in a pristine environment vacuum yeah in a vacuum (laughs) and then think that information is going to correlate to whatever specific firearm they're using it doesn't yeah and 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 just for you guys just to clarify 
I have the same opinion. You, you have a ballistics calculator. You say, I'm shooting this bullet. It's going this fast. And it goes, oh, these are your holds or whatever at different. I think those are good enough for maybe get you on paper. But that's that's far from being the truth. Right. You absolutely have to know where your guns hit with the ammo, the specific ammo that you're firing. Um, you're getting further away from the mic, so be careful. Okay, cool. We'll make sure they can hear you. The... Um, <laughs> don't take anything for granted you know you've got to if you're going to decide on you know x bullet weight x manufacturer x bullet design uh you have to know where your guns hit with that you know you can't shoot 115 training ammo all the time and then put 115 grain carry ammo in the gun and expect it to hit in the same place what what's your what are you finding right now is a is the good weight for for your pcc 115, 124. 115, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like, um, I like 115. Yeah. Uh, fast, about 1,300 feet per second. Yeah. It's about as fast as you can push it within Sammy specs. Right. But it shoots like a laser beam. Nice. Cool. Anything else? Anything else you want to talk about? You got you got a platform here. Anything? Oh, man, we can hit. Any, pick a topic, man. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I think I've ran through a few. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're doing good, man. Yeah. Um, Again, you can find me uh, on Facebook, Dave Harrington, and uh, website, combatspeed.com. And uh, that's it. Shoot, right. shoot me an email. So here's what we'll do, guys. Uh, we'll wrap this up. If you have uh, a comment or a question for Dave, uh, post them up, and then I will assemble those for the next time he and I are together. And uh, we'll just continue this conversation every time we bump into each other. We'll just very cool. We'll just do it. We'll just do a, another follow up. And maybe you start keeping some notes. I want to say this next Absolutely. time. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. But combatspeed.com, Dave Harrington on Facebook. You guys should train with him. He's the only person I've ever met that can make the earth stop moving when they're shooting. James Jager, Dave Harrington for Tactical Response, reminding you that your responsibility to be ready for the fight never ends.